Okay, uh, let's make a start. Um, uh, welcome to uh, everybody um, and uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, event, which is focused on uh, economic opportunities uh, for offshore wind power, particularly focused on the role of industry clusters. Uh, my name is Llewellyn Hughes and I'm an associate professor at the Australian National University's Crawford School of Public Policy. I'd like to begin uh, firstly by paying my respects uh, to the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land for where I'm uh, speaking with you today and also to pay my respects uh, to the elders of the Wurundjeri nation both past and present. Let me uh, also thank uh, the European Union's uh, SPIPA program, that is the Strategic Partnership for the Implementation of the Paris Agreement, for supporting today's event, while also noting uh, that the opinions which are expressed uh, today are the responsibility uh, of the speakers and don't necessarily reflect the views uh, of the uh, European Union. Some of you uh, may know that uh, just last week, the Global Wind Energy Council uh, released its annual report for 2021. And uh, it has recorded a very bullish picture, particularly for the offshore wind sector, projecting a, a compound annualized growth rate for offshore wind in the region of 31.5%, so about a third uh, over the next five years, with uh, more than 70 gigawatts of offshore expected to be added globally between 2021 and 2025. There are a number of different drivers behind that expectation and that bullish view. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the potential for floating offshore wind uh, to become commercialized at scale. And really crucially for us here in Australia, is the potential role in contributing to that growth of key markets in the Asia Pacific region. And by this, I mean Taiwan, Japan, Vietnam, and South Korea, uh, in addition to the People's Republic of China, of course. Now, uh, with the Australian federal government having tabled its framework legislation for uh, offshore wind development, Australia is really in a position to participate uh, in this development of the Asia Pacific market at scale. And as someone who does a lot of work with the offshore wind sector uh, in, in the Japanese market, where we've got uh, offshore development targets of roughly a gigawatt a year through till 2030 for 10 gigawatts under development by that time, and a 2040 target of 30 to 45 gigawatts, it's really an exciting moment for Australia and also for the region. The other point uh, that's made in uh, the GWAC report this year is the unique position of the offshore wind sector in supporting energy transition. And that's not only uh, through the provision of low carbon electricity, but it's also because of the opportunities to transition the traditional fossil fuel sectors due to complementarities in skills and capabilities between industries like oil and gas and the offshore wind sector, something that we've seen a lot of uh, in the European context. Now, the European uh, experience also shows that the use of industry cluster strategies can play a crucial role in industry scale up. And for that reason, we thought uh, at the Crawford School and at the ANU that it's really an opportune moment to hear from some key stakeholders uh, in Europe uh, and here in Australia about robust strategies for industry development and for capturing the economic value from scale up in the offshore wind sector through the use of cluster strategies. Uh, to that end, we've got an excellent lineup of speakers uh, who are going to share their thoughts with us today. Let me introduce them briefly now. Um, first, uh, I think we have uh, Mr. Mathieu Balou. Uh, Mr. Balou is a, a policy officer in the team in charge of renewable energy policy in the Directorate General for Energy in the European Commission, where he deals with the EU's international energy strategy and has been working closely with EU industry on competitiveness and scale issues. Next, uh, we're um, delighted to have Mr. Mark Itgen from the city of Cuxhaven uh, with us uh, today. 
Uh, Mr. Itkin is the managing director of bu the business development agency for the city of Cuxhaven and is the main contact person for the offshore base there. He has uh, more than 25 years experience in the maritime business, including an offshore wind. Uh, and Cuxhaven has played really a key role in development of offshore wind in Germany and in Europe. So we're very excited to have the opportunity to hear from him today. Next, uh, we will hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Haugland Alsterheim. Mr. Halsterheim is the project manager for the Norwegian offshore wind cluster. Now, Norway's adopted a very deliberate cluster strategy for offshore, uh, for industry development, including in the offshore sector. And Ms. Alsterheim has responsibility there for collaborating with Norwegian industry uh, in identifying Norwegian capabilities that can be deployed in the sector. She also has an Australian accent, I'm delighted to say, after spending some time working in Australia. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Nadia Leibrand. Uh, Dr. Leibrand uh, is the project director for commercial and investment attraction in the Victorian government's Department of Environment, Land, uh, Water and Planning, where her team is leading the development of an offshore wind sector strategy for Victoria. We've asked each of our presenters to speak for about 15 minutes, and that will leave us about 20 to 25 minutes for questions. And we wanna make this an open forum for discussion. So uh, what that means is that you'll, um, when we come uh, past the presentations, you'll be able to, uh, of course, as people are speaking, put your questions into the Q&A uh, panel, as you have seen, um, uh, and we'll be familiar with from Zoom. But also we're going to open up the mics during the Q&A session so that people can raise their hand electronically and, uh, and then um, ask their question. We would just ask the people to keep it brief so that um, we can um, uh, you know, have uh, lots of questions. Just let me take, make two very uh, brief points uh, to finish before I pass things over. Um, firstly, this is the first of uh, a at least a couple of events that we're planning to hold uh, in this area. The next event will be in mid-November and we're focused on regional supply chain issues. We're interested in understanding how those are likely to develop and what Australia, what role Australia may play. So please look for that invitation in your inbox. And then lastly, uh, we're using the opportunity at the ANU of these events uh, to field a survey which is going to look at different people's views of uh, their expectations for the price path and competitiveness of offshore wind, both floating and fixed bottom in the Asia Pacific region moving forward. So that survey is going to come out in a couple of weeks. And so we'd ask you again, it's of course voluntary and anonymous, but we will um, ask uh, that um, if you have the time and you're interested to participate in that survey to help us with our research. And with that, um, let me uh, pass the floor to, uh, to Mathieu for our first presentation. Matthew. I think you'll need to uh, unmute yourself. Hello, Matthew. hello, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Can you yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah, we can Fantastic. hear you. Up, Sorry, thanks. I've had some connection issues. Um, so I, I have some slides, but uh, you'll have yes, to operate they're, them without they're being displayed. them. Yes. So sure. Let's make this work. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is, is Mathieu Bellu. I work indeed for the European Commission's uh, DG Energy. And I would like to, yeah, to introduce this, this event with a few pointers of where we are in the, in the EU and how we see the um, the, the issue of, of offshore wind within our policy um, development. So uh, if you move to the next slide, I will um, present first the context, of course, uh, of renewables in the EU Green Deal, where we stand currently on offshore wind in the EU in terms of, of technology development, and, um, and then explain what uh, last year's uh, offshore strategy was about and, and what we're, we're looking at. Um, so first I will move to the, the renewables in the EU Green Deal. If you move to the slide with the big minus 55 percent, please. Um, everything is um, geared towards our long-term objective of decarbonization. The EU pledged uh, to fully decarbonize its economy by 2050. And that implied significantly raising our climate ambition already by 2030. 
So instead of our um, NDC target of minus 40% greenhouse gases, uh, we we adopted a 55% reduction target for 2030. And this represents most more or less a doubling of uh, our effort for the next decade compared to our previous ambition. Energy represents about 75% of our emissions, um, so it's at the core of this effort. This is why uh, we also propose a new target for renewable energy. Next slide, please. So that's the policy context. Currently, the EU um, is at about 20% of renewable energy in its uh, final energy consumption not only electricity, all energy. Our target was 32% renewables by 2030. We proposed in July a new target of 40% renewables. So we propose to double the share of renewables in the whole economy within uh, 10 years. But the, the EU Green Deal is not just about numbers um, and, and that renewables policy interacts with a number of other um, other policies, for instance, the new EU biodiversity strategy, um, our strategy to improve our buildings and renovate them, specific strategies, for instance, offshore, I'll come to that, and um, energy system integration and hydrogen. What does that mean? Next slide, please. That is really about the system, the energy system of tomorrow. If we want to increase dramatically uh, the share of renewables in our in our economy, and here we're talking about more than 70% renewables in electricity by 2030. Um, it's crucial to completely transform the whole way our energy system is planned, is developed. So this is what this energy system integration strategy is about. Anticipate the energy system of tomorrow by making um, energy efficiency the center of it, of course. Um, it will be a system that is largely based on, on electricity, on renewable electricity, because that's the easiest way to decarbonize um, energy. And for those activities, those uh, processes that cannot easily be converted to electricity, be it in cement, steel, for instance, uh, heavy duty transport, develop new renewable and low carbon fuels, uh, renewable hydrogen in particular. Um, but this has to be really planned in an integrated way and well in advance. So this is really the, the general context uh, in which we're operating. Next, please. Now I would like to move specifically to, to offshore wind. Next, please. Because we've seen spectacular developments there of course, the EU and the North Sea, more more specifically, is um, where where it has happened uh, globally so far. Um, the size of turbines has has increased dramatically. Um, our offshore wind um, capacity, EU only, was is probably above 15 gigawatts. Uh, by now, here I have numbers that are from 2019-2020, I think. Um, the average size of, of, uh, of the offshore wind farms are around, is around 800 megawatts by now. So we are, we are, we are talking uh, about an, an enormous scale already. But if you look at, at our targets for 2030-2050, um, we're, we're looking at another order of, of magnitude uh, for, for the total uh, installed capacity. So um, how, how do we manage that and where will it happen? Um, in the next slide, I, I also want to show that at the moment, 99% of the offshore wind capacity is um, located in five countries around the North Sea. Um, UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Belgium, but but new players are coming in. Next, please. Um, other countries such as Ireland, for instance, or France, have adopted ambitious targets for the, the development of, of offshore wind. Um, Eleven EU countries already have. Um, specific mentions of offshore wind energy in their support schemes for renewables. So, so we are, we're moving to a really 
an, a new era already. Um, as I mean, I, I I won't go into into all the details about about support schemes, but it's also interesting to see that um, offshore wind is already competing with other technologies, uh, is already market ready in many cases. Um, power purchase agreements and especially corporate power purchase agreements are becoming increasingly popular. So um, we are not talking about uh, an, a new immature technology there. Next slide, please. In terms of, of policy, what are the key issues and key barriers that we identify at the moment? One of them is the, the administrative procedure. Offshore wind projects are extremely complex um, their their development, their the, the planning and consenting involves typically many administration, many different administrative bodies, um, which leads to very long permitting procedures, which can be discouraging for for investors. So that's one of the the issues that we are seeking to address in in our legislation. Another one is how do you find space? For that new activity. The context is very different in Australia, of course, but uh, in, in Europe, especially in the, in the North Sea, you already have um, a lot of economic activities in a very small space, transport, uh, shipping, fisheries, tourism, and the cumulative pressure on the environment is very high. You also have very densely populated areas where um, local communities don't necessarily like to have those new wind turbines uh, next to their uh, their city and and on the horizon. So how do you yeah, preempt and avoid conflicts of use and local opposition? Then uh, also very different from Australia, although maybe the the federal uh, versus land discussion could be a bit similar. How do you ensure consistency between the national planning and how do you ensure regional cooperation in these sea basins? Uh, how do you optimize the planning of infrastructure, especially, uh, of course, um, transmission line? And finally, and this is the core of today's event, how do you make sure that uh, the, yeah, the industrial strategy is up to the challenge? Um, the, the EU manufacturers and developers are global leaders at the moment. How do, you, do we retain that edge? How do we support innovation? Um, how do we ensure that uh, the, the whole very complex supply chain is there, be it uh, critical raw materials availability, but also maintenance, the, the, the large ships that are required to install the, the, the wind turbines, um, the skills that, that, that are required for that. Um, how do you match the urgency and the ambition of the, of the targets? And the other side of that industrial strategy is, of course, uh, circularity. How do you improve the recycling? Um, the, the EU industry is now moving fast on the, the recycling of, of the blades of, of wind turbines, but that's an essential aspect uh, that is also critical to ensure public acceptance of that, of course. Next slide, please. So, what is, is the, the EU doing specifically on that? Uh, next, please. We adopted at the end of last year a strategy on offshore renewable energy, not only wind, but, uh, but all uh, offshore marine energies with specific targets for um, 2030 and 2050. Um, but it's really not only about targets. It's about encourage encouraging the, the massive investment that will be required to achieve these and better plan our, our infrastructure and making sure that our legal framework is adapted to, to, to this. Next, please. Um, so the, we, we included in that strategy not um, specific legal proposals at that time, but really um, a clear vision of where we want to go. And that strategy is guiding the, the, the new policy proposals that the European Commission put forward um, since the end of last year. For instance, the new proposals for revising 
the the EU framework on on trans European um, energy networks um, for the the rules on on state aid and and uh, rules on on environmental um, yeah requirements for for energy projects to also um, encourage member states to use the the COVID resilience funds to to support offshore energy. Um, but also to to support the supply chain, uh, where we are setting up a, um, a structured dialogue with the whole um, offshore industry ecosystem beyond the the, the energy um, the, the renewable energy manufacturers only to to really identify what are their their specific policy needs. Um, next, please. It's, it's important to understand that um, we are doing that because we are, we, as I said before, we are moving beyond what was considered as possible um, until now. So until now, we were looking at shallow sea, of course, and it's, it's largely the, the, the North Sea that, that had the, the, the biggest potential. But with floating offshore wind turbines, we, the, the whole EU is becoming uh, attractive for, for offshore wind projects. And if you look at the industry, you would think that, that everything is concentrated, again, around the shores of the, of the North Sea, but the, uh, the supply chain of the uh, offshore wind industry is so broad that uh, it, it really affects industrial sites everywhere across the, the EU. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to mention, of course, that uh, that strategy is not only about offshore wind, but that it considers all offshore renewable strategies and, and that, therefore, it considers different needs because uh, the, the, the technologies are at different stages of, of maturity. And finally, with, the, with the, my last slide of today, the three focus areas um, are on the one hand, maritime spatial planning, as I mentioned, and, and how to ensure a better cross-border and sea basin planning. The second one, the infrastructure and, um, and market design. How do you support uh, the development of, of uh, well-planned infrastructure for, for offshore wind? Who pays for it? And how do you design the market rules to integrate those very high amounts of, of uh, intermittent, intermittent uh, electricity generation, uh, what is the place of, of renewable hydrogen in this, and the last one is about, is about industry and the supply chain. I will stop here because it was already a bit long and it's hard for me to judge uh, how um, well it, it works without, without any uh, video feedback, but uh, thanks very much for inviting me here and I hope you have a great discussion. Thanks, Mathieu. That was just uh, perfect and obviously um, really uh, a tremendous amount there from, um, you know, the more obvious near-term issues like uh, marine spatial planning, but through to really what we're you know, interested in focusing on um, today, which is the key issues around the timing and nature of infrastructure development uh, around what is a large capital intensive, uh, you know, industry um, of some significant uh, complexity. Uh, so um, we hope you can stick around and we're going to try and work, I think, to, um, you know, get you in for a regular Zoom link so that we can participate in the Q&A together. I know Lamita is going to work with you on that. For now, uh, let's move forward um, to hear from Mr. Aitken from the city of uh, Cuxhaven. I think who has had a, a really terrific uh, introduction to, um, uh, to his own uh, presentation. Mark. Yeah, good morning or uh, yeah, good evening to Australia. So uh, first of all, thank you very much to being part of the workshop today. And uh, I think uh, um, I can start right, uh, right away with the PowerPoint I had prepared. It's a bit massive, um, but uh, I think I also will um, jump over some slides, but uh, afterwards you can have it for uh, your um, re review and also that uh, yeah, the, the full full uh, idea of Cuxhaven you can uh, see afterwards. But I will share my screen. Please do. 
Okay, then uh, let's start. So, um, yeah, Cuxhaven already has a long history in uh, offshore wind, uh, more or less uh, one and a half up to two de decades. And uh, I think it was a big benefit um, to have this uh, decision made uh, after uh, um, yeah, 20 years ago um, to go for uh, offshore wind and uh, um, also and uh, coming up uh, offshore wind hydrogen. So uh, I think uh, that is uh, where um, Cuxhaven grows uh, the last uh, 20 years. And I think we will go also uh, with this idea of offshore wind, offshore wind hydrogen for the future. Um, but this and also all uh, this and you can see all in my slides. Oh, yeah, let's. Yeah, Cuxhaven is in the northern part of uh, Germany. I think uh, this, uh, you know, or, already or, or partly. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, in the northern part of Germany. And uh, yeah, we have uh, more or less 170 degrees water around. And therefore, we have to see what's uh, the economic uh, uh, for Cuxhaven. And that's for sure then also the maritime business. And uh, um, talking about the offshore wind business, that's then what's also the idea so that we are uh, more or less have 360 degrees uh, a working area um, still with the, with the water and uh, also with offshore wind, which was a big benefit. Um, yeah, Germany um, and uh, where, where, where are we coming from uh, is the biggest North Sea spa resort with uh, more or less uh, 4 million overnight days, uh, overnight days a, a year. Uh, this and also um, yeah, to see and to observe how we can uh, work um, with this topic um, together with the uh, industry. Um, so that's, uh, but I think we have a quite good uh, and uh, peaceful co accident, existence in uh, Cuxhaven. And uh, right now it works very well. So we have uh, to tourism as well as the industry and uh, yeah, more or less uh, both are splitted into their um, different areas and uh, also the tourism are very interested in um, to um, yeah make a tour to the harbor also the industry itself uh, so therefore yeah i think it uh, worked very well and uh, yeah Cuxhaven is still attractive also with the area around for the tourism development of the harbor and land side infrastructure uh, that was uh, yeah the the are we coming from there were more or less nothing. Um, this was in uh, 80, uh, 1987. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the next uh, slide you will see how, how we worked on this topic and also that the development was uh, very, very good for the, for the region as well as also uh, big steps um, uh, in harbor, uh, harbor structure in, in general. This is a picture actually, um, also with the uh, big uh, factory plant from um, um, Siemens Camesa and also with the uh, yeah, uh, found foundation, uh, not production. This one will start um, um, within this year uh, or in 2022 with uh, Titan Wind. But uh, in, on the picture, you see some um, uh, suction buckets um, for uh, foundations, uh, fund foundation installation. Our um, key length is uh, actually up to um, 2.6 kilometers. And uh, right now we have a new um, our, uh, company Endports, our partner in for the harbor infrastructure is looking for um, berth uh, five to six, uh, five to seven. Um, so ad additionally 1.2 kilometers so that we have uh, or will have at the end um, nearly 2025, uh, 3.6 kilometers of uh, quayside um, for for our partners, um, not only for offshore wind, but also for other industry aspects. Um, yeah, where are, where are we coming from? Our offshore master plan, uh, it has been um, started in 2003, um, also uh, with, a, with a vision um, and uh, this is an also you, uh, always you have to be careful because the vision then always is uh, where's the money coming from, who are the actors, and uh, is uh, Cuxhaven in general also the public um, uh, willing to go this way? But this worked very well. So we started in 2003 with the idea of a master plan offshore wind, and uh, also then started with the activities to build up some uh, plants and also some some factories directly in Cuxhaven at uh, that time with uh, Mr. Becker, uh, also a, a vision vision guide. But uh, yeah, 
it uh, helped helped a lot um, to start uh, Cuxhaven um, or the idea of Cuxhaven um, being part of the offshore wind industry. Um, offshore master plan also, and uh, this and uh, still the idea we are going always uh, through this uh, master plan. And uh, there then we received uh, in 2008 uh, up to 2016 the uh, different births, um, starting with uh, birth one up to birth 1.3. Um, the 10 we, uh, I think, never, never reach uh, because uh, 10 is not allowed from our government, but uh, uh, maybe it will then be 9.8, I don't know. Um, yeah, so therefore, um, I think the development until 2016 uh, was quite massive and also by the investment um, at that time nearly up to um, 600 uh, million euros. Um, I think that was a big step, and also that we um, can position or the position in uh, in in the in Europe was uh, already quite clear, and uh, Cuxhaven, um, yeah, set the benchmark for how to be uh, and how how a harbor has to look like. And in uh, 2017, up to 2019, we then also received another birth. It was uh, birth four. Um, and this uh, was also a quite good step uh, also for the offshore um, wind industry. You see a picture with the, with the um, installation vessels and also that uh, monopiles and whether it's transition, transition pieces can be handled on this uh, birth. We are always uh, interested in to have uh, a quite a good uh, pressure per square meter uh, at the key site as well as the land side um, storage area so that uh, we always uh, able to um, store more or less the, the uh, next generation of uh, monopiles as well as uh, foundations. Yeah, the development is all, not always uh, straightforward. Um, we uh, describe it in phase one, phase two, phase three. Uh, a successful settlement in 2007 up to 2011. Then we have a, a setback and stagnation of, uh, of the industry because also some partners uh, were not able to have these um, um, or to hold this uh, idea of uh, what's uh, needed uh, for this business and also um, with the capital they, they need. Uh, it was not that easy. So therefore phase two was a setback and stagnation. Otherwise, and um, phase three, a breakthrough in 2015 also with Siemens Gamesa, the factory and the plant of uh, Siemens Gamesa. This was uh, quite massive also with the company Ambauer as well as the new company Titan, Titan Wind um, for foundations as well as uh, um, um, tower, tower sections of the um, turbi turbines. Yeah, that was uh, Siemens Camesa, and there are uh, a lot of partners coming up uh, the next slide, but I will also jump through. But uh, Siemens uh, Camesa, I think we have to uh, notice that uh, Siemens Camesa is uh, or built its plant in Cuxhaven with uh, up to um, um, 1,000 uh, employees uh, in, in peaks, uh, also up to th uh, 1,300 uh, employees. And that was a, a quite good step and also um, yeah, a, a good impulse to Cuxhaven. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, Siemens right now is uh, um, doing his uh, refurbishment of the uh, of the factory um, for the next generation of turbines, up to eight uh, eleven megawatt um, turbine, and uh, right now they um, or the last years they produced the eight megawatt, and in some it was uh, twelve hundred units um, they um, gave to the market, so therefore it was a, a quite quite good um, step from Siemens as well as. Uh, for the offshore wind industry to have this plant um, available in, in Europe. Um, yeah, first Siemens sets and also the figures, uh, figures we have right now, um, also the topics commercial industry area up to uh, 100 um, or 17 acres and uh, another 21 acres uh, they bought in uh, 2020, um, also to extend their, their factory. Um, this is quite good for Cuxhaven. And uh, um, quite good, but uh, on the other hand, we do not have um, more commercial land available in Cuxhaven, so therefore we have to extend, but this and also I will show in the uh, next slides. 
And uh, um, total investment uh, of Siemens plant was uh, two, um, 200 um, million euros. And uh, this year um, they already, and uh, again, reinvest uh, of nearly 80 million euros for the um, next generation of uh, turbines. Yeah, this in, uh, company Cooksport, also a big partner, also for uh, services uh, and uh, um, yeah, um, the storage uh, activities as well as uh, uh, load in, load out of uh, offshore um, pieces, uh, starting with the turbines uh, as well as the um, transition pieces and foundations. Yeah, that's a. Uh, Additional um, figures from uh, from Cooksport. Then we have Otto Wolf. It's uh, um, our partner for tugboats as well as uh, boats in uh, general. Uh, he also is uh, and uh, also barges, and he is a, a big partner and also uh, a, a good puzzle to our um, yeah overall services we can uh, um, give to the market uh, from Cookshaven. Then we have Norm Nordmark, uh, a company who is in. Uh, um, yeah, preparing the uh, final final pieces for the turbine of uh, Siemens, um, um, and this is then that the, the units um, will stay 20, 25 years uh, offshore. So they will do the coating of the uh, different parts uh, for Siemens or the turbine, and uh, generally for the Siemens. Then we have Titan Wind Energy. Um, this is our new partner in Cuxhaven after um, Ambo has gone. And uh, uh, Titan Wind is uh, looking forward to prepare the uh, next uh, foundation um, uh, units. I'm talking about monopiles, uh, monopiles in, uh, in the next generation up to um, um, two, uh, 1,500, up to 2,500 uh, tons uh, per unit. Uh, that's quite massive. And also they will then use the, the free area around um, to, um, to have the storage for the, um, yeah, foundations um, of, uh, and as well as in the tower sections. Um, and they also um, thinking about to have and uh, being part of uh, producing um, floating or parts of the floating foundation. Then we have uh, Antec Industrial Services. It's our service partner. They are doing more or less uh, all in one. So a uh, one, one stop uh, agency, um, but this is also part of our offshore portfolio and uh, offshore services we can uh, provide to the market. Then Blue Water Brep, also um, very big uh, in uh, on, and, on and offshore um, um, movements in, uh, in uh, or the parts of, uh, uh, of the offshore and onshore um, units and uh, more or less uh, 3,000 um, parts uh, a year. Um, this uh, and right now mainly and uh, uh, for for Vestas, but this is uh, very good also in experience how to handle these next generation of uh, turbines, which and will have a, a, a weight of up to um, 500, uh, nearly 600 uh, tons per per unit. Yeah, that's in our um, partner um, from the uh, from Cuxhaven. It's the Cuxhaven Hafen Entwicklungsgesellschaft. It's a 100% uh, daughter from the from the city of Cuxhaven. Just that we have our areas and uh, spaces available for the next steps that we have to go in Cuxhaven. Development of the port infrastructure. I told it already. The buses uh, starting with uh, bus one uh, and then ended at. Uh, is uh, 1.3 right now, 1.4, sorry, right now. And uh, with the and, uh, idea of a key length up to um, uh, 3.6 uh, kilometers. Um, this is, is uh, the new we are looking forward to have. It's a uh, birth uh, five to seven that we um, yeah, just started the process um, that um, everyone can give a bit on these uh, birth five to seven. And births eight, nine, as well as nine point three, and partly nine point four. It's the uh, before the for the yellow marking. This and um, births nine point four. This is our area. Uh, I think I have to speed up a bit, um, but uh, this is separately and uh, clustered. But uh, this is just for cosmetic, and uh, you can see how it works. And uh, the green area is Titan. Then the um, um, purple is. Uh, 
with uh, Siemens, uh, also with the additional um, 20.9 uh, acres and the 11 acres uh, nearly free, but uh, you know, uh, in a in a, in a yeah industrial um, business, uh, 11 hectare is more or less nothing. Therefore, we're looking forward to have this uh, extension of our um, harbor area with another uh, 130 acres uh, netto. Um, this is uh, the idea of and uh, to have it available at at least in, uh, in 2030 respectively um, 2035. This is uh, not easy because you have to be careful with the environmental and also with the public that uh, you are not um, um, you are taking too much uh, um, area for, for, for the economy, but uh, this I think is a necessary step um, to go um, for Cuxhaven also with the um, yeah, um, market demand uh, we receive right now. Free industrial area right now, I said uh, it's a supplier D or B, it's uh, nearly nothing, uh, um, seven up to, or five up to seven acres uh, still available. Um, so this, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, more or less nothing in the industrial business. Yeah, this is in the 138 acres uh, and uh, about 200 acres uh, gross. This is just an, uh, how added value can, can read in Cuxhaven. It's uh, just an example from Siemens Gamesa, so an ex ex extract from uh, a study we um, um, made together with uh, Siemens. This I will not go through, but uh, then you will have it afterwards uh, of, uh, of my presentation and also after, afterwards of the workshop. And uh, yeah, investment as a benchmark of uh, success, the results and uh, not only in offshore wind. So right now we are um, uh, first mover, uh, not first mover, but uh, number one in uh, Great, Brit Great Britain transit. Also uh, with uh, what happened uh, to Europe with the Brexit, um, but also in offshore wind, um, as I mentioned, uh, there we are number one with uh, uh, moving parts uh, up to 5,000 pieces, um, Siemens as well as Blue, Blue Water Brab. And uh, where we're coming from also from the 50s and 60s is uh, fishing. There we are still number one in Germany. And then the key facts uh, there you can uh, go through afterwards, but uh, it's the uh, most important that you always have free space available and also a, a, um, a water depth up to uh, um, yeah, 15, 15 meters, and that's given in Cuxhaven. And then also our partners, Blue Water, Brad Brenos, Entec, Niedersachsen Ports, uh, Cuxhaven Hafen Entwicklungsgesellschaft, as well as Titan Wind, I think that's uh, then also the uh, yeah um, the, um, elementary for a successful story we had uh, the last years. Yeah, that's then from my end, and uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just a tremendous um, uh, effort there, and uh, I can see that there are some questions which have come in under the Q and A, also the chat. Um, some of them you, we you know we obviously can um, deal with at the end. But if any of them you wanted to type in um, in response, I see there's a question about um, the full-time equivalent work that, or, or employment opportunities that were created through all of that work that you've just described to us. So if you have any thoughts about that, feel free to put that in, but we'll also have an opportunity to address that at the end. And thanks to those who have put um, the questions uh, in, also around hydrogen, which is obviously of great uh, interest to, uh, to Australia. Uh, let's now pass the floor to Elizabeth. Hello everyone. I'll quickly share my screen. There we go. Let's see. Hope you all can see this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, that's great. That's great. So my name is Elizabeth Edman, as mentioned, and I work for the Norwegian Offshore Wing Cluster. Uh, we're one of many clusters in Norway, uh, one of the biggest ones uh, with a focus on offshore wind. And what I'm going to do today is to introduce you to us, what we do, who we are, um, and also explain some challenges that we have had um, during the, the development of this cluster and also how we think that we uh, help creating opportunities for the industry in Norway. Lastly, I will also shortly introduce the Marine Energy Test Center, which is sort of our executive branch, um, and that's what started the cluster basically, but I'll get more into that uh, later. Um, so firstly, 
Let me just move this. There we go. Uh, so our ambition is and goal is to develop a strong Norwegian supply chain um, for offshore wind, both in Norway, but obviously also into the global floating wind market. Norway has sort of been slightly slow uh, in this development and uh, to get into the, the global markets of offshore wind. And uh, it's sort of a saying in Norway that we missed the, the bottom fixed, um, to be first within bottom fixed. But so that's why we're today focusing mostly towards floating foundations. However, also working towards the bottom fixed because that's where we see it the biggest uh, opportunities at the moment. Um, but our main ambition is to develop um, offshore floating solutions. Um, and um, when I say supply chain, uh, this is what I mean. Uh, we want to make sure that Norwegian companies can provide for the entire supply chain for offshore wind from the development project management to the installation and at the end the decommissioning of the wind farms. We have five focus areas and these are focus areas that we've had since the beginning so some of them are less relevant today however still important. Um, we are at the moment actually working towards uh, making new focus areas and new goals um but these are still very relevant so obviously like i mentioned we want to develop uh, a norwegian supply chain we also want to test and uh, demonstrate new innovation and concepts and technology and this is something that i will come back to later in the presentation when i talk more about the met center uh, the marine energy test center uh, we also want to participate in the international markets for floating wind and also mainly uh, cooperate with international uh, companies, not just within Norway, but we want to be part of the global, the global market. Um, the fourth focus area, which is electricity supply for oil and gas installations, is something that in Norway has been very important because we are a oil and uh, petrol maritime nation with a strong history in oil uh, and gas. So it was important, obviously, to show those sectors that uh, by focusing on offshore wind, we we're not forgetting about the, the oil, the, the old uh, industries that sort of has helped Norway develop um, very, very much. Um, so that's a focus area that we have focused a lot on but it's sort of becoming less relevant now uh, that we're working towards building offshore wind farms um, on its own and that brings me to the fifth focus area which is develop utr Nord and soil ligand ultra tool which is very <laughs> very english um, but those are the two areas where we will start building wind farms in norway um, and also uh, hopefully there will be more of these areas so that norway can can uh, develop further. These are our members. Um, so uh, I think today we have uh, 312 members and um, th there's a vast range uh, of areas that these members work in from, from developers and shipbuilders to the maritime sector, uh, R&D, universities, finance, and uh, and uh, and more. We'll even have some municipalities, Norwegian municipalities. Um, so uh, we feel that these members show, you know, the the interest in Norway from from having banks and finance institutions coming in, showing that they believe that there is an a big uh, chance for investment, and uh, that these are this is a new sector that they want to to uh, end up. So it's worth mentioning our first year as a cluster, I think we had approximately 50 members. The year after that doubled and the year after that, that doubled again. So it just shows how, how the interest has grown, I suppose, uh, from, from the entire Norwegian uh, industry being kind of uh, insecure and not 
sure if they wanted to enter this uh, this industry to now more and more people and companies, um, as well as the Norwegian government showing a very big interest in this. Um, even the well, yesterday was a national was a national election in Norway. Um, so the last government has worked towards uh, the offshore wind industry. So it's going to be interesting to see how the new government when that uh, when that is being made, uh, how, how they approach. Hopefully it will be even better. <laughs> but that's going to be very interesting to see. Moving on, this is us in the cluster administration. Um, I've worked there for approximately one year now. And when I started, it was me and uh, the three gentlemen above me. Uh, if you see my picture on the right side. Uh, since then, we hired three new employees, employees and uh, have actually now also employed three new that will start in October, November. So this again shows that we're growing at the cluster and the, the interest around offshore wind is, is increasing uh, vastly and that we need, we definitely need more people um, to manage all this. So I'm just going to briefly mention how or two ways that we work here in the cluster or ways that our members uh, can, uh, can, can participate in the cluster. One of which is uh, the working groups that we have. So when a member or when a company becomes a member, they can, if they wish, uh, participate in working groups. They can participate in as many as they want. Usually it's only one. Uh, how much activity you want to, or how much you want to participate is sort of up to you. And uh, it's the members that decide how much each working group is doing, how many events and study trips that it, they are participating in. Um, so when we made these working groups, we were listening to the members and what they wanted to, to work within and how, like, where they wanted to develop. So on the right hand side, I have listed all the current working groups. We are also in the process of making new ones um, because some of them are becoming quite big, especially the maritime operations, uh, installation operation and maintenance uh, is quite uh, a big working group. Um, but we see a lot of uh, that the members really quite enjoy using these because they get to talk to other, other members that have the same say, goals or that they can cooperate with. Um, so this is definitely something I would um, encourage other clusters to do as well. Other than the working groups, we have held quite a few events um, just this last year. Obviously due to uh, COVID, we haven't been able to do any study trips. Um, however, usually we will have some in Spain, to Scotland, uh, been to Japan, just to meet with the industries overseas. Uh, and they've been quite successful from what I've heard. Other than that, we have events within the working groups, like I mentioned, some a lot of webinars uh, this past year. And um, every year we also have something called Floating Wind, uh, which is a yearly conference which is international. So we get speakers from both Norway and overseas to talk about the newest, the news uh, within the offshore wind sector and industry. Um, and later this year, we're gonna have like a similar um, workshop event. However, this is just gonna be for Norwegian, the Norwegian industry. Um, but events and workshops are quite, big part of uh, what we do here in, in the cluster to, to work together with the industry and, and of all the companies that are interested. Now, just to show you these two areas that we're currently working towards in Norway is the Utsiran North and the Southern North C2, um, <clears throat> which are the ones that have been circled in red there. So Utsiran North, or Utah North is going to be developing or an area for floating uh, offshore wind, whereas the Southern North Sea is going to be bottom fixed. Uh, we are hoping that more areas like these, like the ones we have 
noted without the circles that they will also open up for business. Uh, for, I mean, obviously we find the 4.5 gigawatts that have been noted here to be too small um, and that we are have the, the companies and the industry to, to go even further than that. Um, however, we'll see how, what the new government will do about that. Um, so this is where Norway is now. We are leading within floating offshore wind, um, at least we like to say so. And uh, our companies have been working, especially Equinor has been working in Scotland with their high wind pumps. Uh, and uh, we're sort of, ho we're hoping and working towards the industrialization. However, Norway has never been known for mass industrialization. So <laughs> this is uh, something that we're just pushing for uh, from, from the cluster and something that our members are definitely eager <laughs> to pursue. Um, then I'm just gonna quickly explain some of the challenges that we found um, for the cluster development. These are mainly for us. Um, I can speak on, on behalf of other clusters in Norway. Um, but like I briefly mentioned, uh, we, Norway is a petrol maritime nation. And uh, in the beginning, it was slightly difficult to promote offshore wind and anything that wasn't <laughs> within the oil and gas sector. I'm sure Australia in some ways can relate uh, with coal. Um, it's something that we have relied on for decades now and to move away from all those um, secure jobs and all the, all the money that lies behind that uh, was a challenge. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, the growth and the, um, well, the growth of our members and the interest in general towards offshore wind is that, that was shown by how the government has worked towards it and opened up for these, these areas. Um, shows that we're in, moving in a positive direction. And this is not as much of a problem today, even though there's still, of course, companies and people who still push for oil and gas, people see that we have to move in a green direction. Uh, a second challenge, which is sort of um, a brag, um, is the growing number of members, like I mentioned with the, the doubling. Um, and hence why we have hired so many new employees is because it's becoming difficult to have like that personal connection with each member, like we had in the beginning and working towards making sure that they get the best experience and get to talk to relevant uh, companies and you know work for them to have a good position in the offshore wind industry. Uh, has been difficult when we've had such a high increase, but this is more of a, it's a positive negative, if that makes sense. It's um, something we're happy about, um, <laughs> but it's worth mentioning anyway to be, be prepared for it. Now, how we find clusters to benefit the industry. Uh, one of the main things that we've talked about here uh, is that the cluster helps ensuring that the existing skills and expertise from the maritime and oil and gas sectors are being used in new industries and in new sectors. Um, like I said, we have to move forward away from oil and we don't want that expertise to go to waste. So we are making sure that all of that can be used in the offshore wind industry. Secondly, we facilitate innovation and new technology. I will go, get into this uh, on the next page, I believe very quickly introducing the Met Center um but like being the middle middle ground between uh all the relevant companies and test facilities where they can test them, their ideas and technology um and as well as connecting research institutions and universities with the industry that sort of falls into the same the same category so let me quickly just show you the met center um these are well, the Met Center is an area on the western coast of Norway where we test um, offshore technology. Uh, we have tested uh, the a high wind uh, windmill, floating windmill that now is now called Sephiros, and also uh, one called Tetraspot that was put out there actually last month. Um, and we 
this sort of shows how the members of the Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster get together and design new technology and test it at this test center before they eventually um, industrialize it and put it out in the wind farms. And one of our biggest success stories is the flagship Horizon project. Um, this all started with uh, document technician Olaf Olsen, as you can see on the logo uh, in the middle there, uh, who had a floating technology that they wanted to test. And then they got together with Iberdrola, Arca Solutions and Unitech, as well as all of these others, and they are now uh, making this windmill that they're going to test from 2022. Yeah. Um, so it's very exciting. So that's why we sort of say that the Met Center is our executive branch um, because we get the companies and then they get together and uh, work towards technology such as this one. Um, lastly, but not least, we're trying to expand here as well so that more test uh, objectives can be, can be put out there. Um, yeah, I think that's it. If you want to have more news, you should follow us on LinkedIn. We post there every single day. So uh, uh, if you want to follow what we're up to, um, check that out. Um, lastly, I just want to say thank you for having me. Thanks, Elizabeth. I can see that Alex uh, has got a question for you um, in the uh, in the chat there um, about uh, the cluster growth. And uh, so feel free to answer, um, but we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, now let me uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Leibbrand for um, some discussion of the uh, Victorian uh, government's current position. Thanks, Nadia. Thank you, Llewellyn. And um, welcome everyone to today's session and thank you for the opportunity to um, to talk a little bit about Victoria's um, opportunities and ambitions for offshore wind. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I hope this works. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, I suppose in contrast to what you've heard so far from the other speakers today, um, uh, as we know, this this sector is still in its infancy in Australia, um, but we are certainly aware of um, the opportunity of offshore wind. Um, and in Victoria, we have um, we've been doing some work, and and you know there's there's quite a bit of um, interest at the moment in um, in establishing uh, the the initial. Um, projects um, that, uh, you know, um, that is currently under development. So I would like to um, start by giving you a bit of a picture and it's very much aligned to some, what if some of the other speakers have been saying today. Um, uh, Victoria um, as a state has a legislated target to achieve net zero by 2050. And um, that is obviously a very ambitious target from, from the perspective of where we are today. Um, so similar to the other um, parts of the world where, you know, the, the agenda is really driven by the need to decarbonize. Um, it's no different here. Um, currently in Victoria, we are sitting at an operational demand of about 49 terawatt hours. Um, based on our preliminary work, and this is, um, this is something that I think only is now starting to really um, kind of be addressed in, in various forums, um, looking at what does net zero by 2050 actually look like when we look at it economy wide and not just in the terms of the electricity sector and some of the work that we've done is indicating that um, you know the, the ranges of, of additional demand that we would need to meet could go up to as high as six times where we are today um, uh, there's a big error bars around all of these values because it's all very uncertain which technologies will actually play a role in 2050 and a lot of these technologies are probably not even um, you know available yet um, in terms of the applications uh, the in energy end use applications but notwithstanding we it's pretty clear that a lot of new generation capacity will be required um, so Despite all of these uncertainties, um, and we all love a good model, so um, AMO has, has recently um, also started to look into um, wider economy-wide um, sort of scenarios to um, assist with their system planning. And um, some of the new scenarios that are popping up now are starting to look at net zero by 2050 
and um, and sort of hydrogen superpower um, being you know the the ultimate um, sort of um, levels of demand. So so it's 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 definitely starting to move in that direction. The narrative is definitely changing in Australia. So then coming to offshore wind, what does that mean? Um, so we know, and this, I'm not gonna go too much into detail because previous speakers have already covered this very well, but, but there's obviously a, a huge amount of new build being planned across the world. And I guess from Australia's perspective, we're looking at that and saying, um, well, you know, this level of investment will definitely um, assist in the technology rapidly uh, um, uh, expanding and, and developing, and that will reduce costs over time. And the, the, the evolution of the, the, the cost curves is obviously very important because currently um, in Australia, we do have abundant onshore um, resources, but we also know that um, this level of expansion is unprecedented in our market. And so it's quite important to understand at what rate these cost curves will come down because um, when you're looking out to 2050, um, that then helps in understanding what the role of offshore wind could be. And we've been doing a fair bit of work around this. Um, and, you know, very, very, um, you know, happy to see, you know, all of the development across the world that's, that's really assisting in, in driving down these costs and making it more affordable ultimately. So, yeah, so, I mean, at the moment, it's still very, uh, you know, it's still a lot more expensive in um, the Australian context compared to onshore. But that said, the Bass Strait um, off the coast of Victoria offers a world-class resource. Um, and when we compare it with the, res the types of resource that you find in these areas where, you know, the markets are much more established, um, like such as the, the, um, what the speakers have been um, speaking about earlier, um, the best trade really is is comparable. Um, so for Victoria, that does represent a really um, uh, a great opportunity to to harness that um, that resource. Um, some speakers have also been speaking about um, floating offshore. Um, obviously, at the moment, um, you know you're looking at fixed um, platforms, um, but but. Certainly, we do. You know, we we're watching closely what's happening with floating because that will obviously um, expand the the potential capacity that could be harnessed. Um, but even if you're looking at fixed, um, and that means you you basically um, restricted to below depths of below 50 or 60 meters. But the best trade is there's actually a, a fair amount of um, resource within those sorts of depths, and um, and we've done some work to sort of understand what the capacity could be. And, and there's certainly um, a lot of opportunity. So in terms of a cluster approach, um, and because I, I think that one of the themes of today was, you know, was around clusters. <clears throat> in, um, in Victoria, we have done quite a bit of work around clusters in other sectors like the hydrogen sector. And we found some really, you know, we, we've seen some really good um, outcomes from those processes. Um, hydro, I mean, sorry, uh, compared to hydrogen, you know, offshore wind is quite, is quite different. Um, and the cluster or hub concept is even much, much, much more relevant, I think, um, because of the scale at which um, these, uh, um, the sector needs to be, uh, needs to develop and, and, and because of the um, amount of supporting infrastructure. So it obviously makes a lot of sense to just, you know, to, to look at it from a, from a hub perspective. Um, we have sort of started, uh, do we do, we, we've been doing work to inform a sector strategy for Victoria for offshore wind. And in order to do that, we have looked at a range of different building blocks. And, um, and you know, some of the, these building blocks are, are, are essentially the elements that you would, you would need to develop concurrently in a, in a hub sort of um, style to support the establishment of the sector initially. And, and you know, the things that come to mind is your, your obvious supporting infrastructure like ports, transmission connections, specialized vessels that need to um, be, be available. Um, there's obviously the, the very important work around site development. There's been a fair bit of discussion around that today. Um, but then there's also um, the, the impact on supply chains and um, the skilled labor that's required and, and all of these pieces um, that need to be developed to ensure that you have a successful industry. So where we are very different 
um, from the, where the other um, parties are at the moment is that we are still really much at the early stages and we're still, th still thinking through how we can ensure that all of these, um, these parts of the puzzle essentially come together in an orderly manner. So, um, so looking at some of the other work we've done on hubs, you know, you could really break it out into um, a few key elements. Um, and those elements are, as you can see there, is essentially um, starting with activating the supply chain. We have had some really good um, progress in the past with, um, with our renewable energy targets that have you know, helped to establish supply chains, but this is at a very, very different scale compared to, um, to that experience, of course. Um, we would be looking, as I mentioned, at um, the technology development and that would be supported by um, the other enabling infrastructure and then developing the skills and the capacity um, and education locally is, is obviously really, really important. And then working hand in hand with our um, traditional owner partners and with all of our communities to ensure that we can um, garner the social license um, will be the key to the success of this endeavor. So I guess um, the finally, you know, I think that maybe just to give you an update of of where we are at um, at the moment, we we are finalising the work on our sector strategy, and very soon we hope to um, to publish a this uh, consultation paper. And once we uh, do publish that, um, that will that will um, kickstart a, a, a very um, in-depth consultation process with all of the various um, uh, interested parties, um, and and we look forward to sharing our thoughts on what the picture may look like for Victoria and what, our, what we think the, the next steps should be and, um, and then getting um, feedback. Um, but we're just finalizing essentially, you know, where we, where we think that uh, this needs to go and, um, and we, will, um, we will soon be speaking with all of you in, in more depth and I would be able to share more, unfortunately at the moment, um, uh, obviously won't be able to speak to the details of that, but, um, but certainly uh, um, looking forward to it. And thank you for your attention today. Thanks, Nadia. Um, that's terrific and gives a really good sense of where the, uh, you know, the, the Victorian government stands today in terms of um, industry development uh, in the area.